The message you're about to listen to is a message from Apostle Eric Nyamiche, the chairman of the Church of Pentecost. Apostle Eric Nyamiche preaches the gospel in its simplest form to help the believers walk in Christ and also how the believer relate with his world. This year, the message is on unleashing the church to possess nation. Join us and let's learn from Apostle Eric Nyamiche and be a blessing to the world. If you are new to this page, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on that notification bell so that when new videos are uploaded, you can have access to it. Make sure you go to our own page and check out for more videos. Thank you. The church is something entirely new, entirely new. Distinct from anything that preceded it and anything that will come after it. Yet, Israel makes a good pattern for our understanding of the church. I'm saying that Israel makes a good pattern for us to understand what the church of God is, our mandate and our purpose. I will therefore begin the discussion by tracing the Jewish root to Christianity. Then I'll, be, I'll begin from Genesis chapter 12. When you're talking about the Jews, then you have to begin with their father Abraham. Genesis 12, 1 to 3. The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And then, the most important of all the instructions and all that God is saying to Abraham is in the last bit of it. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So God calls Abraham, and then he tells him that all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. One man, Abraham. I want you to hold that. All peoples on earth will be blessed through one man, Abraham. All peoples. Now, Israel were a people. The rest of the world were referred to as peoples, Gentiles, the other nations. So he's saying that I will pick you, Abraham. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And through you, all the other nations will be blessed. What does that mean? It only means that the other nations will find favor with God of his redemption story. Now, the Jews were chosen strategically to reveal God to the other nations. He loved all the other nations as well. After all, if you look at Genesis chapter 9, from verse 18 and 19, this is what the scripture says. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. Now, verse 19 says this. These are the three sons of Noah. And from them came the people who were scattered over the whole earth. So at the flood... Eight people were saved. And the Bible says that when the flood was over, all the peoples we see on the face of the earth, they came from one Noah and his children. So all came from Adam. If you like, all came from God. So every human being is a creation of God. So when we are talking about the Canaanites, the Ammonites, the Jebusites, they all came from the ark. And God never hated any of them. But Israel was chosen strategically to reveal to the world who God is. Exodus 19 from verse 3. Went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob. And what you are to tell the people of Israel, the people of Israel. Now beyond Israel, the others are referred to as peoples. So to the people of Israel, now verse 4 says this. 
you yourself have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my commandments or my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Out of all the other nations, you, Israel, will be my treasured possession. Now listen to the last bit. Although the whole earth is mine. So the whole earth has always been God's. But Israel was chosen strategically. Now, verse 6 of Exodus 19. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Now, the scripture is here suggesting that Israel, every one of them, male or female, has a stake in God's divine agenda. They were to be for God a kingdom of priests to the other nations. Hold that in your spirit. The Israelites, male, female, were to be of God a kingdom of priests to the other nations. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Go tell them they are going to be for me priests to the other nations. Now, they were going to stand between God and the peoples. That is the work of the priests. And take their burdens to God. And bring the word of God to the nations. That was the choice of Israel. They were a go between God and the peoples. They were supposed to be a go between God and the people. Now God entered into covenant with Israel because of the choice of them. Now, two things mark the covenant. They were to be circumcised and God also gave them beyond the circumcision, a body of laws. These two separated them from the other nations. Two. One, they were supposed to be circumcised. Abraham was circumcised at age 99. And from that day forward, that was the covenant. Every one of them was supposed to be circumcised. And God gave them a body of laws that would separate them from the other nations. Those days when Israel was attacked, all that the attackers needed to do to find out whether you were a Jew was to draw down your pants. They want to check whether you are circumcised. If you are circumcised, then you are a Jew. They have kept that to today. Now, but my interest today is the body of laws. Deuteronomy 4, 5, and six. Deuteronomy four, five, and six. Yeah. See, I have taught you decrees and laws, as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of. Israel was supposed to possess nations. Now, verse six is the big one. Observe the body of laws carefully. For this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say, Surely, this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Now the laws that God gave through Moses to Israel will shape them, build them, and there will be wisdom to the other nations. They will prosper from their laws and the other nations will draw closer to them to ask them of the source of the laws. So the body of laws was supposed to build them and to separate them as a people for the Lord. Now, they were supposed to teach their children, Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. These commands that I give you today are to be in your heart. Impress them on your children. They were supposed to teach their children. Talk about them when you, when you sit at home 
and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your forehead, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Psalm 78 explain why the teaching of the children was so important. 8 verse 5 says that he decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. Do I have it? Yeah. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel which he commanded our ancestors to what? Teach their children. Why? Let's move on. So that, so, the next generation would, would know them, even the children yet to be born, and that they in turn will tell their children. The next verse. Then, they will put their trust in God, and will not forget his decrees, but will keep God's commands. Very important. God didn't want any gap to come between a generation and the next. The body of laws that will prosper their fathers are supposed to be taught to their children so that they will keep to their God and they will not deviate from him. They were a holy people separated unto God. Now, they were to stay away from pollution by indulging in the practices of the nation. They were to keep away from pollution by not indulging in the practices of the nation. If you read Deuteronomy 7, 1 to 5, you will see all these things there. Verse 6 says that, Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, For you are a people, holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. So keep away from pollution. Don't be like them because you are a chosen people. This was said to Israel. Now, God raised Israel as a people. And in his wisdom, he dispersed them into the nations to impact and to influence the nations and turn them back to God. So God raised these people he chose and then he dispersed them into the nations so that through them as priests to the nations, the others will come to God. They were spread widely to disseminate the knowledge that God is one. They were supposed to go out and teach the world that God is one. Two, and that any nation that puts its trust in God will be blessed. God is one. And that any nation that puts its trust in God will be blessed. They, the Israelites, were to be God's wisdom to the other nations. God's wisdom to the other nations. The Israelites trusted the word of God and actually prayed that his ways may be known among the nations. His saving power among the other nations. They prayed. Let's go and look at one of their prayers. Psalm 67. Psalm 67. It's a beautiful psalm. So we want to take it. Okay. Fine. May God be gracious to us. And bless us. Make his face shine on us. Verse 2. So that your ways may be known on earth. God's ways may be known on earth. Your salvation among the other nations. So look at their prayer. They didn't receive God just for themselves. They were praying that God's salvation would be known, made known among the other nations. Verse 3. May the peoples, that is the Gentiles, praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. Verse 4. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. 
For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. That is the prayer of the Israelite. Now verse 5. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. So now they go out as priests among the nations. And their prayer is that may the peoples come and praise the God of Israel. Verse 6. The land yields its harvest. God. Our God blesses us. Now when God blesses them, why are they praying that God will bless them? Now verse 7. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Yeah. So that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Now, let's take the time and study scripture. So let's go to Psalm 66. Psalm 66. This is another prayer and another song. Shout for joy. To God, all the earth, all the earth, not Israelites alone. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cling before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Now, come. And see what God has done. It's awesome deeds for mankind. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. They are inviting the nations to come. Now verse 7. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Let's read verse 8 together. Ready to go. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sounds of his praise be heard. Now, they are inviting all the peoples to praise, to come and praise their God. They yarded their God. They knew that he is a God among the gods. They were telling the nations, throw your idols away. Come and praise our God. Come and praise our God. They were determined that the nations praise their God too. It was God's purpose that Israel became not a terminal of his blessings, but the channel of his blessings. That is why they said, God bless us, so that the nations will know that you are God. Now as he blesses them, there will be channels that will flow, cause the blessings of God to flow in blessings to the other nations. Each Israelite was a player in God's grand story that stretched far beyond the boundaries of their life, even his own land. Now, wherever they were carried to, they went with the ideals of their religion. I've said that they were dispersed among the nations, but wherever they went, they didn't put their religion aside. They went boldly knowing that they are the chosen people and that they were priests to the other nations. They never took their eyes off Jerusalem, no, and the temple. They never. They went to Babylon, they were still mindful of Jerusalem and the temple. They carried the, these ideas with them. Psalm 37 verse 1 says that, By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. If I, verse 5 says that, now verse 5. If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its kill. They don't want to forget Zion or Jerusalem. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Daniel 6, 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room. Where the windows opened towards were Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he has done before. So whilst they were in their diaspora, they were still mindful of Jerusalem. They kept their ideals and they remembered the God who has sent them out to possess their nations. That is what they have been taught. 
That is who they were. Priests to the nations. Priests to the nations. So some of the teenagers, when they found themselves in Babylon, before Nebuchadnezzar, they never feared him. They believed that they had a God that was much more powerful than the God of the Nebuchadnezzars. So the Nebuchadnezzar would say, bow down. He will instruct and they will say that our God will deliver us. Even if he decides not to deliver us, we will not bow down to your God. Yeah. They stood before Nebuchadnezzar knowing very well that they were a priest to Nebuchadnezzar. Now in many times, at least two times in the book of Daniel, Daniel mesmerized Nebuchadnezzar to the extent that he bowed in praise of Daniel's God two times. Our God is a great God. Israel revealed his glory to the nations. He revealed his glory to the nations. So in the diaspora, the eyes of God was still upon them. Because they were a priest to God. And God needed them. You see, when they were vying away from his commands, he would send his prophets to whip them in line. God was always with the Israelites. Sometimes we say that because of their evil, God sent them into Babylon. No, listen. God was dispersing them. He was sending them far away into the other lands. To the extent that any time that they were forgetting their God, a prophet would be raised to bring them back in line. Because God needed them. God needed the Israelites. He needed them. He needed them. They kept spreading. They kept penetrating. They kept penetrating nations until the set time. Now, Galatians 4 verse 4. Galatians 4 4. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Verse 5 says, to redeem those under the law that we might receive abduction of sonship. Now, this one is very important. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. The set time was not only as in heaven's readiness in sending the son, but also the earth's readiness to receive the Messiah. Paul is saying that there was a set time. And I'm saying that the set time was not just heaven's readiness, but the earth was also prepared to receive the Messiah. Remember that Jesus was the seed of God. And for the seed to be planted, the earth must be worked on. So that when the seed is planted, it will be able to grow. It will be able to grow. Now, James Herbert King, a Canadian theologian, once said, and I quote, The Jewish dispersion was the greatest single factor in preparing the world for the coming of the Messiah and the preaching of the gospel. The Jewish dispersion was a the, the greatest single factor in preparing the world for the coming of the Messiah and the preaching of the gospel, unquote. Now, the, the dispersion of the Jews was so widespread that Strabo, a Greek, reported in AD 70 that, I quote, it is hard to find a single place on the habitable earth that has not admitted this tribe of men and is not possessed by it. By AD 70, Strabo was saying that it is hard to find a single place on the habitable earth that has not admitted this tribe of men and is not possessed by this group. God dispersed them and they went very far. So by AD 70, they were everywhere. They were everywhere. God 
was preparing the grounds for the Messiah. He was preparing the grounds for the ultimate. Now, let's look at the impact of the, of the Jewish dispersion on Christianity. Let's look at how the grounds were prepared to receive Jesus Christ. The Jews were under the influence of Judaism. The Jews who were under the influence of Judaism also forcefully resisted the influence of the Roman and the Grecian world. These Jews resisted it because they thought that they had something that was great. So they would not allow any contamination. Judaism also had some positive influence on the Gentiles. See, to the extent that some of them, even before Christ came, had joined them in the synagogue. Now, the framework of Christianity is founded on Judaism. So by the time Christ came and Christianity was evolving out of Judaism, it was easy for people to understand because they had, if you like, they have laid the foundation. Now, with the Judaism background, it made it easier for Jews in the diaspora to turn to Christianity because they were preaching from the same word that they had. Their synagogues serve as meeting places for the Christians. Are we together? So the Pauls and the Peters, the Jewish synagogues were, were places where they went to actually proclaim Christ. Their synagogue helped. Now by the time Jesus came, they had interpreted the Old Testament into Greek. They called that the Septuagint. So the Old Testament was also interpreted into Greek. So whilst they were in the Roman world and the Grecian world, they were still reading their Old Testament scripture. But this time it was in Greek. Now that made it easy for the early Christians and those who were also in the Gentile world because they had a reference, they had the Bible. But all this foundation was laid by the Jews who were dispersed into the nations. Have I communicated? Fine. What they did in the nations was to interpret and reinterpret the scripture to fit their contest. They interpreted and reinterpreted the scripture to fit their contest. Now, if we are able to possess the nations, we must always know that we operate within contest. And so we must interpret scripture and reinterpret to fit the contest. Now, when the young people came and they were singing, they were jumping and so glad. And I was seated there and my eyes was full, were full of tears. You see, I see that this one can only be God. He has gone way ahead of us and he's building his own church. So we don't have to interrupt and disturb God at all. Yeah. This is their contest. We must interpret and reinterpret the scripture to suit their contest so that Christ is real for them. Christ is real for them in their generation. If we do that, we will take the next generation with us into the possessing the nation's agenda. Why did they do that? They were a people on a mission. Because God has told their, father, their father Abraham that in you shall all the nations be blessed. So there were people on a mission that through them the nations will be blessed. Now, they kept spreading. They kept penetrating the nations until the set time. What do we mean by that? Let's go back to Galatians 4. Now we'll take it from verse 2. The heir is subject to guidance and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, 
born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, my interest here is in verse 2. So, where is verse 2? The heir is subject to guidance and trustees until the time set by his father. So, here, Israel is referred to as the guardian and the trustee. So, God took Israel to be a guardian and a trustee until Christ, who is the heir, of the almighty God was revealed. But until then, Israel acted as a guardian and a trustee. So when Christ came, Israel's work had been completed. Now, Israel gave us Christ. Sometimes we tend to think that because Israel failed God. That is why we have Christians today. No. Once God chooses you, he will not allow you to fail. Yeah. They were only acting as guardian. Now, Pastor, come. Ukraine. This is Israel. God chose Israel. So that out of Israel, all the other nations will be blessed. He dispersed them among the nations, but the eyes of God was on them. He was preparing heaven and earth for the redemption. Remember that far back in the Garden of Eden, God told the serpent, that the seed of the woman will crush your head. So in the mind of God, what will bring the redemption is the seed of a certain woman. But you cannot have a certain woman without a nation. She should belong to a certain people. You cannot have a human being crushing the head of the serpent, not from any nation. No. So when God chose Israel, it was just a matter of time. One day, when heaven was set and the earth was ready, Israel gave birth to Jesus. He gave birth to Jesus. Once Israel gave birth to Jesus, Israel's work was finished. So it is finished. Go ahead and sit down. So Israel's work was finished. Now listen. He, she has finally produced the Messiah. The Bible describes him as the desire of the nations. God's salvation. The seed of the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. Simon, Simon sang a song and said, Sovereign Lord, let me now depart in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared from the beginning of the earth. Now, Lord, let me depart. Your salvation has been reviewed. I have seen him. Let me die in peace. Let me die in peace. Hmm. But let us remember that when God called Abraham, he said, out of you shall the, the peoples of the earth be blessed. He reiterated this instruction to him severally. Let's go and pick it from Genesis 22 this time. 22. I'll read verse 18. Genesis 22, 18. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Do you have it? Okay, so Genesis twenty two eighteen. I want you to repeat this after me. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed 
Because you have obeyed me. Now, Abraham had children. At least, most of us know of two. Isaac and Ishmael. But the scripture says that, and through your offspring, not offsprings. So are we talking about Isaac or Ishmael? Meanwhile, when the wife died, Abraham married again, and Abraham gave birth to six children. So in total, he had eight children. Which of them is the offspring? Paul settled the confusion. Galatians 3 verse 16. Galatians 3 verse 16. Want us to project Galatians 3.16. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his what? Seed. Scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, but unto your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. He settles the story. So all along, when God was saying that out of you, the nations will be blessed, he was thinking about one person. It wasn't about Isaac. No. It wasn't about Ishmael. It wasn't about the Midian or any of Abraham's children. But it was Christ. Now, Galatians 3 verse 8. Let's go back to Paul. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So he's saying that when God told Abraham that all nations will be blessed through you, he was announcing the gospel in advance. So the gospel was announced in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, in advance, far before Christ was born. When we say the gospel, we are talking about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And he, the Bible is saying that God, when he said to Abraham, in you shall the nations of the earth be blessed, he was announcing the, the death the barrier, and the resurrection of Christ in advance. So Paul is saying that the offspring was Christ. Now one day, when Christ was finally born, let's listen to the angels. Luke 2, verse 10. Let's start from verse 9. Let us pick their feelings. Verse 9. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Verse 10. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy. For how many people? For how many people? Now, so he chose Israel. That out of Israel, he chose Jesus that all the ends of the earth will be blessed. So Christ has arrived. What does that mean in practice? Romans 10 verse 4. What does that mean practically? Now, let's take the King James if you have. Before we bring the NIV. This scripture is very important. Now, Romans 10 4. If we don't have the King James, we can take the NIV. Christ is the culmination of the law. So that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Now the King James will say that Christ is the end of the law. But the NIV brings it, makes it a bit more um, acceptable. So that when we say the end, what does that mean? And he says that he is the culmination of the law. What does this mean? He is the final stage of the law. So Israel was always being led by the law of Moses. But Christ was the final stage. Once it got to Christ, 
the law has to be altered. Final stage. The highest point or the decisive point of the law. Christ is the decisive point of the law. Everything culminated in him. The law came from Moses through Israel. They were working with it. When Christ was born, everything ended in him. The highest point. Now, what does that mean in practice? God is now going to demand a new order. God is going to demand a new order. So from Christ onwards, God demanded a new order. A new kind of righteousness found in Christ alone. By becoming, by the coming of Christ, new righteousness by the law of Moses, or the, the righteousness by the law of Moses is rendered obsolete. Now, we read verse 4 of Romans 10. Let's take verse, verse 5. Let's look at Moses' confidence in the law that he received from God and what he said concerning the law. Verse 5. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. Now, Moses was so confident that if you do the things in the law, you will live by them, you will not die. That was Moses. Very confident in the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But you see, Hebrews 8 verse 10 has something to say. Let's go to Hebrews 8 from verse 10. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time. There's going to be a time. After that time, I will establish a new covenant. Declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. So now it's not going to be laws on tablets like that of the Moses. A new one is going to be put in our hearts and in our minds. Now. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord. Because they will all know me from the least of them to the, great, to the greatest. Now verse 12. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Verse 13. Now shall we read 13 together? By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one what? Absolute. And what is absolute and outdated is soon, will soon what? Disappear. Yeah. Now, the old one will soon disappear. Because by the coming of Christ, the old order is rendered what? Absolute. And it will soon disappear. It will soon disappear. There is now a new way to righteousness found in Christ. Let's go back to Romans 10. We read verse 4, verse 5. Now we'll take it from verse 9. Verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Simple. Simple. Not follow ten commandments. Simple. What of if you forget number nine? What happens? No. Now there's a new order. A new law. If you, de if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Full stop. You will be saved. For it is with your heart where the instructions are now written that you believe and are justified and with your mouth that confession is made. What? That, that your faith uh, that your faith that with your mouth that your prophet, you profess your faith and are saved. Verse 11. All scripture says anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. 
For there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles. Now the new order, there is no difference between what? Jews and Gentiles. God is bringing all nations under Christ. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Now let's take the big one. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So in you shall all nations be blessed, be saved. It was found in Christ. Now everyone, it doesn't matter whether you are rich or poor, white, black, or colored, anyone that calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But Jesus Christ did not just come to save individual sinners, but to form a community called the church. So from Christ forward, those who were saved they have formed a community called the church. He says, I will build my church. And the church is going to be the most powerful thing on earth. To the extent that even the gates of hell will not be able to stand against his onslaught. It is the most powerful thing on earth, brothers and sisters. That is the church. That is just church. It is a mystery that has been revealed. That through Jesus, the Gentiles, we too, have a part in God. But this church has a purpose. Now listen. In the Old Testament, and even in Jesus' time, there were two groups of people. But there has been a third one. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32. 1 Corinthians 10, 32. Hmm. Now, do not cause anyone to stumble, whether you, Greeks, those days we are used to either you were a Jew or you were a Gentile. Then now he has another group or the church of God. So by the coming of Christ, the world is not just divided into Jews or Gentiles. But there's a third group, the church of God. When a Jew receives Jesus, he becomes a member of the church of God. When a Gentile receives Jesus, he becomes a member of the, ter- uh, the church of God. When you don't receive Christ, you remain a Jew. When if you don't receive Christ as a Gentile, you remain a Gentile. But the, the third group is those of us who are here. Those of us who have received Christ. This is the new order. The new order, the church of God. The church of God. This is the mystery that has been revealed in Christ for all of us. This new society called the church is an extension of the family of God in heaven. (laughs) So one day Jesus said, "If if you are praying, say that our Father who art in heaven If our father is in heaven, then some of our brothers are also in heaven. If if I were there, I would have asked, uh, maybe Peter should have asked, if our father is there, what about our brothers? Jesus would have said, your brothers there too are also praying. Our father in heaven. Our father is in heaven. So when we say the church is an extension of the family of God up there, it is a household of God. The pillar of and foundation of truth. That is the church. It's a people not limited by geographical location, race, or nationality, but spread across so that through them, all the peoples everywhere in the world will be blessed. So because now the church takes the position of Israel, but the command to Abraham still remains that out of you, the nations will be blessed. So now the church takes the baton and the Bible says that we too have to possess the land so that through us, the world will be blessed. He was made a curse for us so that we, those who who were supposed to be cursed, will be be redeemed. Let's go to Galatians 3, 13, 14. And then I'll put a comma here. We'll continue some other time. 
Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who is hanged on the tree. Now, I like verse 14. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So that by faith, we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Now, my interest is not in telling Abraham that I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. My interest is in the last bit. Out of you shall all nations be blessed. So this promise is for us too. That I want you to know that the church should position herself such that through us, those who do not know Christ will know him. But as a member of the church, I want you to pledge to yourself that out of me shall nations be blessed. Yeah. Out of me, nations must be blessed. Because of me, my household has to be saved. Because of me, those who do not know Christ should know Christ. We want to possess the nations so that his manifold wisdom will shine through the church to transform nations. God has called to himself a certain group of people. A certain group of people. Let me just describe them. And then we will pray. Titus 2, verse 3 and 14. Titus 2, 3 and 14. Likewise. No, sorry, 13 and 14, sorry. Titus chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. Let me stand this way. While we wait for the blessed hope, we are waiting. Because he says, our father in heaven. If our father is in heaven, then that is our home. So we are strangers on this earth. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, he will come again. While we wait on earth, we are waiting. Verse 14 says this. He's saying that that Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify us for himself. A people. Say a people. That are his very own. Eager to do what is good. This is the church. We are a people. That are his very own. <laughs> One day I was dressing up. And when I was trying to tag my tax, this one, I looked at my face in the mirror. I looked so handsome. <laughs> I said, that is the child of God. That is the child of God. He has redeemed us to himself, a people that are his very own. I want you to have this in your spirit. You are God's. He says that we are eager not to go back to evil but to do that which is good. Shall we rise unto our feet? This is the church. This is the church. If you belong to the church, you are blessed. We are a people of God. We are heirs of the Father. We are joint heirs with the Son. We are people of the kingdom. We are eager to do what is good. Can we possess the nations? Ah. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. The IMD will come. You see, the wonderful thing about you is that because of the agenda that he has for you, Christ has stolen himself back to dwell in you by his spirit. <laughs> so when you see me going, the 
there's something on my inside. Something on my inside. He has equipped us for the tax ahead. No hell, no incantation, no imagination can stop the onslaught of the church. We only have to gear ourselves up because we will possess the nations. Whether the devil likes it or not, shall we lift up our hands? Let us blow some holy tongues. Kayemo lebesanda.